presence, we ask that you would draw us near to you. That you would open up our hearts and our minds to you. That you would turn the focus of our attention to you. And what you would want to do is we gather this morning in your name. We ask, O oh Lord, that in all that happens, you would speak to us. You would form in us that which you desire. And so we say to you, speak, Lord, your servants of the city. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. that somehow God pays more attention to you when you're doing good and pays less attention to you when you are doing evil? If that's true, then that means you don't know a lot about the God of Jacob and the story that we read this morning. Because what happens is, is that Jacob, which of course means the one that grabs the heel of his brother, supplanter, a schemer, a conniver who cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright and his blessing, who took off with everything that he could from, in essence, the family farm, took everything that perhaps belonged to his brother as well. And yet, it was to him, to Jacob, that God said he would take him and that he would make out of him a great nation. There was one problem. Jacob, because he was a schemer, did not have the character, the interior character, to take the role that God had given him. All Jacob knew how to do was to scheme and to plot. We would call it manipulation. That's what we're talking about. And that's exactly what's going on before we get into the story this morning. He is heading back home. And he knows by every right his brother, who has become rich and famous in his own right, should be sending out an army to come and kill him. He has no idea what to do except to plot. He doesn't know how to apologize. He just knows how to plot. So what he does is they have to cross this little place called the Jabba, which is a tributary of the Jordan River. And that's where everybody's going to flock to go across. So what does he do? He sends his servants. He sends all of his animals, and finally he sends all of his family. What is he doing? He's hoping when all of this comes by, Esau will go, oh, he's a formidable opponent. And look at all of his family. I can't kill the head of his family. So both to try to show who he is as a powerful man, but also to gain his sympathy. He sends all those people across first, so Jacob is all by himself. Jacob's going to cross the next morning. In other words, so to make sure they get way far ahead. So that if there is going to be some kind of ambush, they'll come at him only. But something happens that Jacob does not <clears throat> expect at all. As he is there at this tributary, the Jabbok, he wrestles. He wrestles with a figure, and he doesn't even know who it is. The scripture says that he wrestles with a man, because that's what Jacob first thinks that he is. But this is unlike any man that Jacob has ever wrestled. So much so that they literally, and it means they're, when it says they're wrestling, it means literally in the Hebrew, they're in the dirt. In other words, this is a real fight. And as they are literally going throughout the night in wrestling, finally, this man wants to break, through, break free. Jacob does not want to let him go. And the scripture, the English reading of this is not actually quite accurate. It says he struck his thigh, like somehow he broke it. No, no, no. Actually, what it literally means is that he just kind of did this with his hand. Certainly not enough to try to shrivel up a sinew, which is what happened. In other words, Jacob knew that when he went lame like that, he was dealing with something a lot bigger, something more, much more powerful than a mere human being. Nobody can literally just touch a man's thigh and see a sinew shrivel up right underneath it. So he knows at that point he's dealing with something supernatural. You see what's going on here? <clears throat> Jacob was to have been a man 
powerful. Someone with great physical stature as well as wealth. What has he lost? I mean, look at it this way. If you're like this with spear in hand and those standing around you, and you're walking like this to meet your opponent, that's a pretty powerful picture. If you're strong and you're muscular. It looks very, very different. If you're like this, and you're coming to meet your opponent, and you're literally dragging a leg. It looks like that's pretty easy pickings, isn't it? What it was God doing? God was humbling Jacob. Breaking down his pride. So that the only thing he had at that point, he couldn't meet this opponent on a battlefield. It never would have happened. He would have been killed immediately. Instead, God humbled Jacob so that the only defense he had was God's supernatural protection. <laughs> there was nothing in that leg that was going to help him stand in battle. Either God was going to fight on his behalf, or it was, he was going to be defeated. In other words, for this man to be the very patriarch of Israel, God had to do something to him, to humble him, to bring him to the point of utter dependence upon God for him to do the job that God wanted him to do. Wealth wasn't enough. Scheming intelligence wasn't enough. Physical brawn was not enough. All of those things that should have marked him as a man worthy of a large position of honor were not enough in God's eyes. What God wanted in his leader was someone who was not going to be a schemer, but instead someone who would be utterly dependent upon God and upon God's leadership. And for that to happen, God, in the form of this human being, literally had to fight Jacob to the ground to bring that about. It's a, I have to tell you, when I read that story, it's a chilling lesson. Mm -hmm. Because what's the lesson? The lesson is, is that if we're going to do what God wants us to do in this life, all of the things that the world holds up as to be admired, wealth, physical prowess, intelligence, the, those matter very little, you see, in the eyes of God. There's a scripture that says that the Lord has no pleasure in the might of a horse, or even in the strength of a man, but the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him. In other words, on those who are willing to say, the task in front of me, regardless of what that might be, is bigger than my capability. If I'm going to do this in a way that pleases you, I need your help. I need your supernatural help to lead me and to guide me and to give me what I don't already have. Because I confess to you, O oh Lord, that I might try to find a way to manipulate what I want to have happen, but that's not what you want of me. In fact, there's a line in Proverbs that says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction and death. Just because I think it's a great idea doesn't in any way begin to make it the will of God. I need God's wisdom and His guidance, but for that to happen, there has to be some kind of work done in me so that I know how to turn to Him, so that my heart is open to Him. So it's not about me being complete and strong and self-sufficient. Instead, in the eyes of God, it's about God taking me and literally breaking me. So that all I can do is rely on Him. That was Jacob's job, where the angel of God met him, fought him, literally shriveled up the sinew in his leg, marking him forever as a man who could only do things under God's dependence. And that's what Jacob needed to be the patriarch of Israel, that God made him. The same theme is going on in the gospel reading with the feeding of the 5,000. <coughs> There's an impossible situation right in front of them. 5,000 men, not counting women and children, so there could have been 15,000 people there. They've been with him a long time. It's time for a meal. So Jesus says, 
You give them something to eat. <laughs> Can you imagine? The disciples, I'm sure, said, we have nothing. What do you mean? We have this little guy over here. He's got a couple of, you know, little tiny loaves. And that means like a thing of pita, as you and I would see it. And a couple of pieces of smoked fish. And, and that's it. In other words, Jesus is presenting them with a situation that is impossible for them to be able to act on. They need God's supernatural break in health to do what they could have never have done on their own. But instead of God doing something difficult to Jacob to remind him forever that he had to rely on God, God does something else. He blesses and performs a miracle to show the disciples, this is who this is really for, that no matter what your physical circumstances are, you can rely on God to take care of you each step of the way. He knows how to take a little and make it a lot when he is in it. In fact, the story is, is that even on both Jacob and with the story of the feeding of the 5,000, if you have a lot, but you don't have much God, then you don't have much. Yeah. Not according to what the scripture teaches. But as it says, he will do a lot with the little. He'll take one man, Jacob, humble him, break it, and use it to literally be a part of the formation of the nation of Israel. He will take a small boy with five loaves and two fishes and in God's presence use that in a way that literally feeds a crowd supernaturally, so much so that there are, what, 12 baskets left over of food? It's an extraordinary, it's, it's hugely extravagant. So the question for you and for me is, am I willing to yield? Am I willing to say, God, I need your supernatural help for me to live the life that I have been given? Oh, I can get by. But there's something in me that hungers for something more than that. And believe me, if you've got that hunger, that's what God has put in your heart. And, but that means coming to Him and being flat out honest about who you are. Notice the prayer that we said at the beginning, or at least that I said in you heard. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. Well, I can put my name in there. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend me, because I cannot continue in safety without your help. Protect and govern me always by your goodness. That's the prayer of Jacob. Someone who understands both the wickedness that exists within my own heart my tendency to do what I want to do and to figure it out my way. And the need that I have for God to break through and to break me of my need to follow my way and my willingness to be open to God's leadership in my life, to do the thing that I would never normally expect but is exactly what it is that He wants. And that's that's really what these lessons are about. And for God to do that, quite honestly, is an act of His mercy. <laughs> Have you ever had stubborn kids? You give them advice and they don't pay attention. And what do you say? Well, I guess you're just going to have to figure this out on your own, don't you? Well, if you get enough of those, I have to figure this out on my own inside of you, you finally can begin to get to the point. Of I mean you get stubborn and cynical. Or you get humble. Yeah. And it's the humbling that you want, not the stubborn and the cynical. Because it's that humble heart, that tender heart, that says, okay, God, I give up. I've had enough Javix in my life. I want you to come and lead me and make me the person that you want me. Let your continual mercy cleanse and defend me. That's the cry of this morning. And the wonder of it is, the wonder of it is that God entirely gives us what we need, even though we don't deserve it a bit. Jacob, by every right, should have been killed by that angel, or Esau should have had his revenge for everything that Jacob did. But God not only spared him, he humbled him, 
and made him the leader that God wanted him to be. That crowd that showed up for Jesus, did they want to see a Messiah? No, no, no. They just wanted somebody else to do a miracle. And who were they? With a crowd that big, were they somehow all law bearers? Probably not. They were just this random crowd of all kinds of people. If you had to pick out the deserving for the undeserving, you might not have had 5,000 people left over. But what did Jesus do? He took that little bread and that little fish, broke it and blessed it, and literally gave so much that everybody, no matter their moral condition, no matter the state of their character, were entirely filled by God's miraculous gifts. That's how he is. This is not about me getting what I deserve. Oh, I don't want to get what I deserve. But instead, crying out because I know that I need his mercy. And knowing that I ask for his mercy. What the scripture says again and again and again is that he gives mercy to those who ask. So, in some ways, this choice is us. You will have places where God will break you, where things will not go the way you want it, no matter what your best efforts are, where things started operating in a way that you didn't expect that makes you worse off, and either you're going to get stubborn and keep pressing in, or you're going to get on your knees and say, God, I need you to show me what to do. That's your job. And so doing, God will begin to do work in your life that you never could imagine. It'll cost you everything, just like Jacob. But it is entirely worth it. Because the man or the woman who is clothed in the mercy of God is far more useful than the man who stands in stubbornness, continually wanting it his way. Which do you want to be? The scripture this morning says, the better way is the way of God's mercy. Amen.